So it's Italy who are the champions of Europe. That is not something I thought I'd be saying uh, a month ago, as recently as a month ago, when uh, when they took the pitch against Turkey and beat them 3-0. But Italy, Roberto Mancini's Italy, are uh, officially, officially Euro 2020 winners after a 1-1 a penalty shootout win over Gareth Southgate's England at Wembley Stadium in London. Impressive, impressive result from uh, from the Atsudi to win their first major trophy since the 2006 World Cup. Hell of a job by uh, by by Mancini to construct the squad, but just the squad itself from beginning to end to to leave no doubt. I mean, this was a nation that um, I think a lot of people can agree were the best team in the tournament from beginning to end. And they proved that with uh, a, a gritty but deserved win over England in uh, in the cup final. So let's talk about it. Let's uh, let's break down what we just saw. The the match wrapped up what about an hour ago uh, it, when I when I started clicking the record button. Match wrapped up about an hour ago. Had some time to to take a step back, think about what we just watched, and uh, I think the the only real place that we can start is with the penalty shootout that we saw. Um, and and more specifically, to to ask the question, what was Gareth Southgate thinking? I mean, what what was he thinking? This was a manager who, for the first what three group games, and then three knockout games, and then the first half of of the final was was flawless, was perfect. He got every decision right, and it just it completely undoes itself in the, the the most emotional and the most important part of the entire competition to to choose first of all to choose a 19 year old who's never taken a single penalty for Arsenal or for England to have him take arguably the most important penalty in uh, in the nation's history is is a staggering decision um, and and we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit because I really I really don't understand that and also to to pick Jaden Sancho and Marcus Rashford to kick, to to shoot third and fourth, and bringing them on in the 119th minute and having their first major contribution be taking penalties in a cup final from 12 yards out. Um, I I would like to hear his explanation because I don't totally understand it. Uh, it. It you know, and hindsight is 2020. If they make those penalties, I'm sure we're talking about this with a different context. But uh, they didn't. They missed. All three of them missed. They, the three in a row. Rashford hit the post, and then uh, Sancho and, and Saka both had their penalties saved by Gianluigi Donnarumma. So, first of all, what is what is Gareth Southgate thinking? I don't understand the uh, the logic behind picking those five players, especially with players like Jack Grealish and uh, and Raheem Sterling, and even to an extent Luke Shaw, leaving them uh, out, not letting them take penalties, and, and leaving it instead to the other three. That's. Uh, that's the first thing with this match. I'm not so sure what uh, what was going on through the mind of the England manager. It's so disappointing, too, because, like I said, he'd been so perfect and so brilliant tactically up until that point. And it just, you know, he, he fumbled it. He fumbled it at the last moment when, when they could have won their first major trophy in 60 years. Uh, but I think if we're talking about other parts of this match, Gareth Southgate does deserve some credit for his team selection. Um, when, when the, the lineups dropped, we saw England were going to play in that three back slash five back with Kyle Walker playing as the right center back alongside Harry Maguire and John Stones. Um, I think it's got the, the, the conception, that shape that Gareth Southgate uses. It, it has the, this notion that it's, it's negative, it's defensive. And to an extent it is, um, and it had a lot of people, on, on social media crying out why are why are we playing this way why are we bringing Italy on to us that's that's how this match is going to go um but he nailed it Gareth Southgate got got that decision right because inside two minutes Luke Shaw who would not have been able to get into a position like that uh had England been playing in a four back Luke Shaw gets free at the far post uh, a beautiful cross in from Kieran Trippier to uh to to find the the foot of Luke Shaw who by the way is the other fullback who's being given that that freedom and that license to roam and to attack the pitch with three at the back um that decision pays off instantly because England opened the scoring inside two minutes Kieran Trippier to Luke Shaw so um an example of of Gareth Southgate acing his tactics yet again that's one thing that he did perfectly 
all tournament that I think everybody can acknowledge is that his starting team selection, he never got wrong once. I don't think, I don't think he, he was seven for seven in that regard. I don't think he made a single misstep, this match included, even against an Italy side that uh, play their best football when they're on the front foot, when they can get into the attacking third. He wasn't afraid to go away from that, that seven at the back to an extent. And uh, it, it paid off right away because those fullbacks had had the the ability to get forward and get into a position to create a goal right off the bat. Um, England looked horrible. Not England, excuse me. Well, towards the end, maybe. But Italy, it looked horrible at the start of this match. They looked uh, defensively. They were in shambles. There was space all over the pitch. Um, it seemed like they weren't sending anybody forward in attack because they were now so focused on on defending and and. Uh, Mopping up what what space they were leaving at the back, Raheem Sterling caused the the Italy defense so many problems by just picking up the ball and, and running at them because they left so much space in that middle third. Uh, Raheem Sterling was was fantastic. Luke Shaw had an incredible game, um, and Italy for the first I guess thirty minutes of this match were horrible. But and this is where you started to feel Italy were going to get a goal back. England started to to be content with sitting on a one-goal lead, with with playing for 1-0. And against an Italian side that has displayed all tournament long that they are really free-flowing and exciting and creative in attack, uh, that was, was a bold decision. It was it was an interesting decision to, to now sit back and play in a true back seven with with the, the three center backs and the two fullbacks playing in a line, and then Declan Rice and Calvin Phillips staying very disciplined and very composed right in front of, of the, the center back trio. Yes, you're leading in a cup final, but you're giving an opposition really close to an hour to find an equalizer that throughout the tournament, they have not had much difficulty finding or at least scoring goals because Italy had not been behind for at all, I think, this this tournament. When, when England scored, um, that was the first time that, that Italy went behind. Uh, but Italy had displayed time and time again that they have no problem finding the back of the net. And so I was confused by why England kind of sat back and, and absorbed pressure and invited Italy onto them. Because as we saw in, in the semifinal between England and Spain, although Spain lost that semifinal to, to Italy, uh, Spain gave England the blueprint on how to keep this Italy side quiet. And that is to play on the front foot and, and keep possession of the ball and force Italy to sit in a low block and try to beat you on the counterattack. And yes, Spain lost that match. Um but they played very, very well, and you can argue Spain were unlucky to lose that match and uh, to, to not advance into the final. Regardless of that result, Spain showed England how to beat Italy, which is by staying on the front foot and not giving them time and space with the ball. Because that midfield th- midfield trio that Italy have with Nicola Barella and Jorginho and Marco Verratti were... Uh, once Italy had more space to operate, they were fantastic. And certainly Verratti and Jorginho more so than, than Barella, who was a more advanced midfielder he was trying to get into the final third and Jorginho and Verratti were the ones that were kind of pulling the strings and and progressing from defense to attack and the reason why Italy were able to grow into the game and to to start to dominate possession of the ball and to really at at a certain point late in the first half and certainly into the second half look like the the equalizer was inevitable was because Verratti and Jorginho were given more space in the the central channels and in the middle third to pick out passes wide or pick out passes into Chidu Immobile. And that was because England, for for whatever reason, after 25, 30 minutes, went from let's stay on the front foot, hunt for a second, to let's sit back, let's play for one nil, and let's let's you know see see this one out the way that that we've been doing. And um and that's a knock that I think a lot of people have had on England for a long time and it never Really made huge waves because England were winning matches, and so there was no reason to be upset with with the way Gareth Southgate was was picking his team. But you know, when we all things considered, and and to be fair, this is an England side with one of the best strikers on the planet in the form of Harry Kane, Raheem Sterling, who was exceptional all tournament long for uh, for England. But on the bench, it's got the likes of of. Jaden Sancho and Jack Grealish and Bukayo Saka and, and all these skilled attacking players, Marcus Rashford, another one. It 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 doesn't make a whole lot of sense in general why England would at times use shapes that are, are so defensive and so negative. And it worked up until up until the the what thirtieth minute of of today. But uh, 
so much attacking talent that they've had on the bench all tournament long that they they didn't use to to its fullest. And again, up until now, it worked for England. I think that that's a big reason why a lot of people didn't make a big fuss about it, specifically against Germany. They they went to that same formation against Germany, a match that a lot of people thought they were going to lose. A lot of people were, were up in arms about the, the negative and defensive shape that Gareth Southgate chose, and then they won, so it wasn't a big deal. Um, but today the story was a little bit different because Italy were more comfortable with keeping the ball at their feet and progressing into the final third and, and, and playing quickly too, playing quickly, interplay, one-two passing um, to kind of break down what England were trying to do defensively. Italy get their goal. It comes off a corner. It's a, a scrum inside a penalty area, and uh, Leonardo Bonucci, from a, a, a cracking finish from about a yard and a half out, equalizes the scoreline for uh, for Italy one one. But again, it, it for for a long long time it felt inevitable. That goal came uh, what the the fifty fifth sixtieth minute sixty seventh minute. Um, but you felt it was coming really all second half and and towards the end of the first half. You felt it wasn't a matter of if Italy equalized. It was a matter of when Italy equalized. Lo and behold, they did. And then we saw England have to kind of break out of what they had been doing and, and be a bit more adventurous going forward. Federico Chiesa, take a bow. That man was was fantastic for Italy today. Even in the first 25, 30 minutes when Italy weren't playing well, uh, Federico Chiesa was. He was he was up for the challenge. He was really, really lively on both flanks. He started on the right. He moved to uh, to the left at certain points. But I mean, he was absolutely exceptional. Just, just the blistering pace was on on full display, and just ran straight at defenders, and in many cases ran ran past defenders. Made some interesting angled runs in behind to to get the England defense to think when not many of the other Italy attackers were were forcing them to do that. So, so so disappointing, I think, to see Chiesa go off with an injury towards the end of the second half because he was a player that I was really really enjoying uh, throughout this entire match, and hopefully he's all right. I do think he will be. I don't think it was anything. Super, super significant, but um, Federico Chiesa, I thought, was was fantastic. I thought Lorenzo Insigne, up until he was was removed, was fantastic. I thought Giorgio Chiellini was uh, match-saving for, for Italy. Um, I think the image that a lot of people will remember will be that tug on the back of Bukayo Saka's shirt, but uh, throughout the full 120 minutes, Giorgio Chiellini is the reason why Italy didn't concede three or four times throughout this match, probably. Um, he was... was absolutely brilliant at the back 35 years old playing like he's 25 Chiellini um, and deservedly so won uh, one man of the match honors it is unlucky for England and it is it is a bit disappointing as well to see them come this close after tournament after tournament after tournament of, of disappointment and and underperforming and just frustration to come this close to a major international uh, international trophy in front of their home fans too at Wembley Stadium and, uh, and to lose in penalties, that's so gut-wrenching, especially with, everybody knows, the, the history of, of the English national team and penalties. Gareth Southgate very well knows, uh, knows that history. It is, it is painful. It is, it is a bit disappointing. Um, but this is a squad, and I think most England fans understand this. This is a squad that is not going away. I mean, the best players in this team, Harry Kane, Jack Grealish, uh, uh, Mason Mount, Bukayo Saka, Jaden Sancho, Marcus Rashford, Declan Rice, Calvin Phillips. Um, I just named, what, eight or nine off off the dome without even really thinking too hard. They're all going to play massive, massive roles in not only next year's World Cup, but Euro 2024 and likely World Cup 2026 in, uh, in the USA as well. So this is a squad that will only get better. It is, it is upsetting a little bit to see them come this close after... All the other storylines from this tournament, the, the the it's coming home and the six out of seven matches being played at Wembley Stadium. It almost seemed written in the sand that England were gonna were gonna come home and, and win this tournament in front of their home fans. Unlucky for them that they weren't able to, but I mean, take a step back and 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 look at Italy and what they've done. Because as impressive as Ital as as England, excuse me, as impressive as England were today and this tournament, Italy has won up them over the last month or so. And it's it's all because of the way they've so quickly changed the complexion around this team. People forget, because it feels so long ago, Italy entered this summer's Euros not as a nation that were a big, heavy favorite. They were one of the second-tier nations that, that you know, we, we looked at them as, yeah, they're good, yeah, they've got talent, Maybe it's not their time. Maybe it's a bit too early. But yeah, they could go on and win the thing with a little bit of luck. That is what they got, to be fair. They got a, a big a big dose of luck with France being eliminated so early in the knockout phase. 
Um, but that should not take away what Italy has done by by themselves. Perfect in the group phase, literally perfect in the group phase. Three matches, three wins, nine points, zero goals conceded. The best team in the group phase of this competition. Then they beat Austria, and then they beat the world number one Belgium, and then they beat a Spanish side that had 70% possession and that that limited them to to two or three chances. Italy were uncomfortable, and they still found a way to win. And then they go and they knock off the the second favorite to win the competition back when it began in uh, in England. On their turf, the complexion around this Italy side has changed so quickly, so drastically, and it's it's because of of well a couple things. It's a because of Roberto Mancini and and uh, the tactics that he's implemented and the team selection that he's brought and the consistency from match to match to match that Roberto Mancini implements. But also, it's it's the young players that have found their place in this Atsuri squad quicker than I think a lot of us expected them to. With Nicolo Barella playing a massively important role, uh, Federico Chiesa, like I said, was my man of the match before he got taken off. Um, uh, Chudri Mobley, even. He's not he's not young, but he's, he's... In terms of Italy at international competitions, this was his first. This was Immobile's first major international competition with Italy. Um, it's so impressive the way they've been able to so drastically change the the, the way that we're, we're talking about them. Um, this was a side that didn't even make the World Cup in 2018. This was a side that that were were eliminated in that in that UEFA playoff. They were knocked out by Sweden and they missed out on the World Cup entirely. They were in shambles, what three years ago? Well, I guess four years ago because that qualifying was in 2017. And then right after that, Roberto Mancini comes in. He completely changes what this Italian side wants to do. He puts long term plans in, which. Got mixed reviews because Italy is Italy and they need success year after year after year. And Roberto Mancini said, well, let's take a step back. We are a nation in, in shambles at the moment. Let's look to the future. That's exactly what they did. And it has paid off a lot quicker than I think a lot of us expected to. This is an Italian side that is one win away from tying the 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 record in international football for the most matches played without losing. They're sitting at 34. They haven't lost a match since September 2018. That is almost three years since the Italian national side has been on the losing end of of any match. It's it's incredible what they've been able to do in such a short amount of time. Italy, the winners on the night, the champions of Europe in 2021, but both of these sides, Italy and England, will enter the World Cup in 2022 as, I would say, two of the big favorites. Um, and I don't think that's reactionary. I genuinely think England certainly will enter the World Cup as, as one of the big favorites. And Italy, how how can you not look at Italy this year and and not consider them a favorite in a World Cup that's in 17 months? Um, I think maybe your biggest concern is the, the defense, the Chiellini and Bonucci center back pairing. If today and if this tournament was any indication, don't worry about them until... 10 years from now, because they will be perfectly fine. Uh, those two dudes will be running the Italian back line until they're 50, if uh, if today was any indication. And even still, they've got some really uh, talented young center backs in the fold anyway. So um, Italy and England, fantastic match, fantastic Euro 2020 final. This is not the last time we're hearing from either Italy or England in the immediate future with the players that they have in their squad right now. Um, happy to see Italy win. I, um, you know, selfishly and... and Maybe to, to, to stroke my own ego a little bit. I was, I think, higher on them than a lot of people were after match day one, after they beat Turkey 3-0. Um, and they only went and they did the damn thing. They won the tournament and, and uh, they did it in pretty convincing style. The team of the tournament from match day one up until the final, I think. I don't think there was anybody better across uh, across the entire tournament. The right team won. The, the appropriate team won. And uh, unless you support the losing side, that's always uh, always a good sign. So... Um, that'll do it, I suppose, for the, the immediate recap video. That is, uh, just a few things that I noticed from, from today's final that I wanted to talk about. And I wanted to, to give credit to, to both of these sides as well, because this is not the last time that we're going to hear from either one of them. Uh, let me know in the comments what you thought of today's cup final. If you're an Italy fan, let me know how happy you are. If you're an England fan, let me know how disappointed you are. If you're a fan of a different nation, let me know what you thought. Let me know who you were rooting for. Let me know, um, your man of the match, your biggest takeaways, anything anything at all about about this match because uh, it was, I think, a really, really good one. Um, I know a lot of people don't like finals that go to penalties. I uh, oh, I think it's exciting. At least the, the 10 minutes when they're taking penalties, I think, is, is so, so thrilling. 
But the first 120 minutes of this final, um, I think, did it justice. It was a really, really good match to watch. Um, and I think a lot of people were concerned that it might not have been with two sides that were so competent defensively. We got a really good match. So let me know in the comments what you thought. Um, go ahead and follow me on Twitter as well, at WillFowler5. Follow London's Finest on Twitter, at London's Finest QU. Those are, or London's Finest is the, the show that me and two of my buddies do every Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. in the UK, where we hop on a Zoom call, talk about the biggest news stories in uh, in the world of the sport, international football, club football, European football, North American football, everything. We talk about every last bit of it. So uh, go and follow that. Again, at London's Finest QU, I will link both of those things in the description below. I will be coming at you with another video tomorrow or... What day is today? Sunday? So tomorrow or Tuesday, uh, my Euro 2020 team of the tournament. Want to call out a couple players from uh, from this summer who I think really, really stood out. Um, fair warning, both of these nations will be represented, will be well represented. Well, maybe not well. No, they'll be well represented, I think. You make the final, you got to have a couple players that are balling out. Um, so I will see you for that video. Again, thank you so much for watching, and I will uh, I will see you in the next one.